Good evening, I'm John Beebe. And I'm Dorenda Boswell. Well, which newspaper is the worst in America? According to an article in the Columbia Journalism Review, it's the Daily Oklahoman. The article begins by noting that many Oklahomans refuse to buy the Metro's dominant newspaper. Here is an excerpt. Maybe you could find critics in any American city where an influential newspaper and billionaire publisher reign, but it's doubtful they could match the fervor of these uh, aggrieved Oklahomans, these Democrats and Republicans of all colors and classes, ranchers, teachers, and oil executives. They live with a civic wound that's been festering for 25 years, a newspaper whose unflattering nickname has become so ingrained in the state lexicon that from Muskogee to Guyman, hardly a literate soul doesn't know of the daily disappointment. What other major newspaper in a metro area of one million people and with a newsroom of 145 full-time reporters and editors has only three African Americans on its news staff? Where else can you find a big city er editorial page run by Christian Coalition devotee plucked from Washington, D.C.'s right-wing Free Congress Foundation that not only demonizes unions, environmentalists, feminists, Planned Parenthood, and public education, but also seems obsessed with lecturing gays? Surprise. Mm. From an Oklahoman editorial titled Sin No More, there's no solid proof that anyone is born a homosexual. Homosexuality is a sin. But to deny that a sin is a sin and wallow in it is the first step towards damnation. To recognize bad behavior as a sin, repent of it, and go and sin no more is the first step towards salvation. Want lots of enterprising in-depth stories with plenty of world and national news in your newspaper's front section? How about praline recipes instead? The article was written by Bruce Selkraig, a former U.S. Senate investigator and staff writer for Sports Illustrated. Dorinda. <laughs> Well, in the Vatican City, Pope John Paul II deplored efforts to give gay unions the same recognition as marriages between men and women Thursday, lamenting the widespread deterioration of the natural and religious sense of marriage. The Vatican frowns on giving gay couples benefits such as pensions or public housing or allowing homosexuals to marry. A few small cities and towns in Italy have recently taken such initiatives to the embarrassment of local prelates. The Pope's long-standing position on homosexuality is that homosexuals should be treated compassionately, but he rules out homosexual sex as well as any sex outside marriage. It's not possible to ignore the growing phenomenon of simple de facto unions and the insistent opinion campaigns to obtain conjugal dignity for unions even among peoples from the same sex, John Paul said. He also said it is the only uh, it is only in the union between two sexually different persons that the perfection of the individual can occur in a synthesis of unity and of mutual psychic physical completeness. The Pope told officials from the Vatican Tribunal that the rules on request for marriage annulments. Now, stressing duty, commitment, parenthood, and the divine order, the Pope said there is more to marriage than romantic or sexual love, which can fade. The gay rights organization Archie Gay swiftly reacted, calling John Paul's conception of marriage a step backward to the days before people wed for love. The president of Archie Gay, Sergio Loguidis, Guidis, excuse me, said in a statement, this might be the first time in two centuries that a pontiff has attacked the role of love, affirming a preference for a relationship coldly based on rational values. In the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, an annulment means a marriage never actually existed. Since Catholics are forbidden to divorce, an annulment permits people to remarry. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, in the State of the Union address on January 19th, President Clinton called for Congress to pass the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, but not before recognizing a civil rights icon. Since 1997, our initiative on race has sought to bridge the divides between and among our people. In its report last fall, the Initiatives Advisory Board found that Americans really do want to bring our people together across racial lines. We know it's been a long journey. For some, it goes back to before the beginning of our republic. For others, back since the Civil War. For others, throughout the 20th century. But for most of us alive today, in a very real sense, this journey began 43 years ago, when a woman named Rosa Parks sat down on a bus in Alabama and wouldn't get up. 
she's sitting down with the first lady tonight, and she may get up or not as she chooses. We thank her. that our continuing racial problems are aggravated, as the presidential initiative said, by opportunity gaps. The initiative I've outlined tonight will help to close them. But we know that the discrimination gap has not been fully closed either. Discrimination or violence because of race or religion, ancestry or gender, disability or sexual orientation is wrong and it ought to be illegal. Therefore, I ask Congress to make the Employment Non-Discrimination Act and the Hate Crimes Prevention Act the law of the land. Our thanks to CNBC for that. Uh, now, ENDA is proposed national legislation that would prohibit employers from discriminating against employees solely on the basis of their sexual orientation. Dorinda? That was exciting. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Well, in Toronto, Duncan Shaw was considered a cautious judge, not prone to making waves. Suddenly, he is Canada's most reviled public figure, targeted by threats and receiving police protection because of his ruling that possession of child pornography should not be a crime. Now, Shaw is a justice for 11 years with the British Columbia Supreme Court, lost his profile on January 15th when he ruled that the federal law against possessing child pornography violated the privacy and freedom of expression rights of John Sharp, a retired city planner from Vancouver. Shaw didn't object to the laws against producing or distributing child pornography, but said that there was no evidence that possessing such material posed any direct threat to children. The intrusion into freedom of expression and the right of privacy is so profound that it's not outweighed by the limited beneficial effects of the prohibition, Shaw wrote. The ruling triggered a nationwide outcry, and Sharp couldn't afford a lawyer after his arrest in 1995, so he defended himself on charges of possessing photographs of nude children as well as pornographic literature. And um, I wanted to tell you that, uh, well, Jim Abbott, a parliament uh, member for the right wing, uh, the Reform Party, he said any judge that puts any other rights above the protection of children does not reflect the values of Canadian society. Now, Sharp, he argued that, I argued freedom of consciousness. One has the right to be in possession of one's own thoughts. And uh, he is the divorced father of two sons who says he is a homosexual. I am used to being considered a pariah, he said. It's not an issue that can be rationally debated in public. Shaw's critics, the judge, were angered by two key aspects of his ruling. The suggestion that child pornography didn't necessarily incite sexual molestation and the emphasis is on protecting the rights of child pornography consumers. Very interesting. I know that story just came off the wire not so long ago. Yes. We haven't had a chance to edit that, so yeah. that, that, very interesting. Yes. Very interesting. More to that, I'm sure. Yes. Well, having won the first lawsuit in the country against the Boy Scouts of America's discriminatory ban on gay members and leaders, Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund went before the New Jersey Supreme Court to defend its victory on behalf of Eagle Scout James Dale. Lambda senior staff attorney Evan Wolfson argued on behalf of Dale, saying James Dale exemplifies what scouting truly is all about, honesty and respect for the rights of others. 
the lower court was right when it said scouting is not about discrimination and should not be shielded from New Jersey's strong civil rights law. Dale, now 27, rose to the rank of Eagle Scout and was invited to become an assistant scoutmaster only to be forced out in 1990 by the National Boy Scouts of America when they learned in a school newspaper article that he is gay. Earlier this year, the United States Supreme Court declined to hear an unrelated challenge to the Boy Scouts of America's exclusionary policies, while the California Supreme Court ruled that the BSA is not covered under the state's more restrictive civil rights law. And I wanted to back up real quick, briefly, mm -hmm. to say that on the story of the Daily Oklahoman, I was not aware of this, but they even charged to put an obituary in their paper. Now, there may be other papers out there that do the same thing. Uh, in my experiences, I've never had to pay to have an obituary mm. put in, in my newspaper. I haven't so, either. Quite interesting. Well, we'll be right back. Stay with us, and uh, we'll have uh, Chuck Jones with Inside Out. It's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to me. I was really shocked when I found out I was infected. I didn't think anything like this could ever happen to me. Only certain people get it. I'm a good example that you can get AIDS from heterosexual sex. Who cares? I'm trying to make the best of the time that I have left, because realistically, I really don't know how much time that is. You could be putting yourself at risk. Call 1-800-342-AIDS. Thanks for staying with us. In tonight's Inside Out, we have Greg Friday, who is the president of the Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Alliance on the OU campus. Greg, thanks for being with us. Now, did I get that right? You are the president of the organization? Uh, we use administrative co-chairs. Administrative co-chair. I'm co the administrative co-chair, and then I have a planning co-chair. Okay. So you're not really the, you're not the guy on top. You have someone that kind of helps you out in that yeah. arena. Well, we talked a little earlier, and it sounds like that the organization is really um, a very busy organization. When did it first get started, and um, what led it to where it is now? It, it originally started as the Stonewall Group in the early... 70s and it wasn't mm -hmm. an official organization then and then it became a, a, a recognized organization in 1987. Okay and in just like the last year or so it's really picked up some speed hasn't it? Um, what, what did you do this last year that really kind of got it moving? We have some, some just some really great dedicated leaders. Um, there's myself, um, Kent Doss, the um, planning co-chair, Carl Sarko, the treasurer and Will Rye, the secretary, and they're just very dedicated. Um, That's good. And they work hard. Now, how visible is this organization on the OU campus? We're getting more visible um, this semester since we since the organizations kind of come together. Mm -hmm. We've um, worked on branching out into doing other things, getting involved with other organizations on the campus as well as other GLBT organizations. Do you get any state. kind of negative flack from perhaps the religious organizations or just straight people in general towards the group? No, um, other student organizations as well as the faculty and staff have just been extremely supportive. Been That's fantastic. Impressed. I really think that attitudes are changing in regards to that. I think especially on um, university campuses, it seems like that um, students' ideas, they're getting to know homosexual people and they know that they're just like anyone else, and they're kind of changing their attitudes. You have an upcoming event, is that right? Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about when it is, where it is, and what's going to be going on? Okay, it'll be um, March 27th, which will be a Saturday. It will be in Edmond, and um, it's sponsored by OLIKE, which is a new organization um, of which the OUGLBA is a member, and it represents student organizations throughout the state on the university campuses. Okay. And um, it'll be a full day conference. There'll be um, several different subjects people can attend. And then after the conference, there'll be a march on the Capitol sponsored by the um, Oklahoma Gay Lesbian Political Caucus. And then a um, prom, semi-formal prom after that. So it'll be a hmm. full day and evening of it. A gay prom, that sounds interesting. I like that idea. The prom you never had. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> the prom you wish you would have had. Sure. <laughs> Well, so tell me more about this March on the Capitol steps. That, that interests me. Okay. Um, the, um, straight here a minute. The um, Oklahoma Gay Lesbian Flu Caucus is sponsoring this. And um, what it is? You say this is March 27th? Did I yes, get that right? this will be March 27th. Okay. 
So you'll want to definitely keep a lookout for, it, hopefully it'll be on the news, the, the other news. Right. Telling about the, um, the gay and lesbian groups meeting on the um, state, state capitol steps. Right. That sounds really exciting. That's part of equality begins at home. Um, all the states are trying to do something at the capitol this year. Now you have some upcoming events that you're sponsoring um, on the OU campus. Right. Right. Now, what are some of the upcoming events that you have? Okay, as, as part of um, coming out, or not coming out, but um, Awareness Week, mm -hmm. we'll be having um, a film festival on campus, and we'll be having a return of some of the um, panel discussions we've sponsored in the past. Okay. Um, the Homosexuality and Religion panel discussion, which has really been a big success with the students. Um, we have PFLAG come, and they discuss coming out from parents' perspective. Well, I think I, I remember hearing about the um, homosexuality and religion discussion that you had last time, and I think especially in this state that that is a very good and um, important discussion that needs to be had, and I, I applaud you for having that. I really do. Well, um, Greg, I thank you very much. Time does go by so fast, and there is so much to cover. Um, tell us again when the conference is and where, and if they want to... Um, find out more about that, I mean, who they can call and things like that. Okay, they can call us at the GLBA. The conference will be the 27th, mm -hmm. which is a Saturday, and they can call us at 325-4452 um, or 4GLB. Okay. Well, thank you very much, thank Greg. And we'll be right back. Actually, we're swinging over to um, John and Dorinda. Well, what disease could be uh, really bad in the next couple of, of decades as AIDS has been? Desmond Stone will be up next with your health news. Stay with us, please. Mm -hmm. I've taught my kids just the way my mama taught me. She gave me a strong sense about what's right. She called it mother wit. <laughs> Even as young as my kids are, they know their way around. And they're well aware I can draw the line if I have to. <laughs> but with AIDS out there, I'm going to have to dig a little deeper and talk a little longer about drugs, sex, and AIDS. We can help you talk about AIDS. For a free guide, call 1-800-342-AIDS. Welcome back and good evening. Scientists at Loyola University in Chicago have linked psychological stress to the elevation of several chemicals in the body, which appear to increase present levels of HIV in the blood or to cause HIV activation. Stress has also been associated with the reactivation of other latent viruses, such as the herpes virus, which they say may also encourage HIV replication. The authors of the study concluded the best way to temper the progression of stress-associated HIV is to do something as simple as using stress reduction techniques, psychotherapy, or becoming involved in a support group. At its annual meeting recently, the American Dental Association blasted tongue piercing, claiming the practice is a public health hazard. Dr. Timothy Rose, president of the ADA, said, the risk of disease has to be immense, adding that lasting nerve damage could also result after having the tongue pierced. A report from The Economist says that tuberculosis is rampant in many regions of the former Soviet Union, with the epidemic hitting hardest in Russian jails where 20,000 prisoners have reportedly died of TB within the past two years. The report estimates that, it, that as that as many as 200 million people globally could be infected with the disease by the year 2020. Even the more affluent nation of Great Britain has seen a 100% increase in TB cases within the past 10 years, but according to the latest reports from the CDC, the U.S. has seen a decrease in TB cases between 1992 and 1997. But the report cautions the rates of infection differ by geographic region and population groups, with foreign-born persons continuing to show a steady rate of infection. Oklahoma reported a drop of 2% of, of confirmed cases within the past five years. And that wraps it up for your health news. Have a great week. John, Dorinda, back to you. Thank you, Desmond. One of the village people, a member of the village people, is now homeless. We'll be back with our entertainment news and uh, Chuck Jones in just a moment. I was scared to take the HIV test. I knew once I did, there was no turning back. Now that I know, though, I can go on about my life, make some goals. I'm working hard to stay healthy, thinking about going back to school. 
motivated to do the things I've always wanted to do. Life seems so much more important now. For information on the prevention and treatment of HIV, call 1-800-342-AIDS. Good evening, I'm Chuck Jones with your entertainment news. With all the pre-Oscar hype surrounding the hit movie Shakespeare in Love, a question which undoubtedly comes up in college Shakespeare classes has to be raised once more. And that question is, was William Shakespeare really straight? While the new movie on the whole is accurate about Shakespeare's marriage and the fact that he left his wife to pursue his work in London, was he really that much into women? The Sonnet 20, which seems to be written to a young man, sheds some doubt on the subject. While human sexuality was not divided into gay and straight in Elizabethan times, English scholars say that in today's terms at least, Shakespeare was almost certainly bisexual. And since the opening of the 1999 Sundance Film Festival, the most sought after film appears to be Mark Ilsley's zany comedy, Happy Texas, about a pair of prison escapees who pose as a gay couple and are hired to direct a drag show. The movie has sparked a high stakes bidding war following its premiere this last Sunday. Bidding for domestic rights alone is expected to top $6 million. Some critics are calling the film this year's The Full Monty. Prints of the film have been rushed to Hollywood screening bosses of New Line and Miramax. Happy Texas stars Jeremy Northam, Steve Zahn, William H. Macy, and Elena Douglas. And finally, on a very serious note, it seems that one of the former members of the 70s disco group, The Village People, is homeless. Victor Willis, who performed as the policeman, has been living in a building in San Francisco's Lower Haight neighborhood for the past few years. Although he has been there long enough to stake a claim in, to the property, the city is contesting the claim, saying that Willis and his fellow squatters have held noisy parties, engaged in drug activity, and violated building and health codes. Following a concerted effort by police to evict the squatters, it seems that the former disco star may be back on the street. John and Dorinda? To be gay? Or not to be gay? That is the question. William Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> who knows? Stay with us and we'll be right back with some closing comments. I love to work out. I like my body to be perfect. That's because I lead an active social life. I want to look good. But no matter what shape you're in, anyone can get the AIDS virus. And one workout that can protect you from the AIDS virus is not to take risks when it comes to sex. Find out what kind of behavior puts you at risk. Call your local AIDS hotline or 1-800-342-AIDS. Fergie's a faggot. He has to fix this problem. I don't think being gay is something we can fix. Perverted. I don't want him in our house. He's only 17. Where will he go? But he's our son. He's not my son anymore. Not my son. Not my son. Not my son. Not my son. You may have noticed with the first show this month in January that uh, normally we have Ginger Lamar, our weather lady, with mm -hmm. us. But unfortunately, what had happened was, to explain a little bit, we got word last week, she was actually in Switzerland over the holidays and uh, skiing, and she got caught up in an avalanche. <gasps> what got caught? Well, I, I'll leave that to her to tell her you. Her hair, probably, week. maybe. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to say that fortunately they dug her out, and she Yay. managed to survive, and I, I think she's going to give us the whole story. Uh, when we have her on next week. So she will all be right. back for the Excellent. first show in February. We want to let you all know that so you'll tune in and w listen to Ginger Lamar's weather prediction for this winter weather that we're having. And, and the fact wow. that we're having right now, it's a little rainy out there and yeah. possibly with some snow mix. 60 degrees one day and 30 below. Well, Will, Will Rogers yeah. said, if you don't like the weather in Oklahoma, just wait a minute. Mm -hmm. That was one of his famous sayings. We uh, also encourage all of you all to call into the talk back line. We appreciate your input, and we appreciate you tuning in tonight and every Thursday night. We'll see you next week, and have a great week. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.